so I'm Joe Conway. I've been around the Postgres community for since the late 1990s. I've been a committer uh, since like 2003. Uh, I, if you've ever used set returning functions, that was a feature I added long, long ago. I wrote DBLink, um, a bunch of other stuff. Most of the big stuff I did was years ago. Mostly these days, I kind of manage people, so I do less coding. But I still fix bugs here and there and do a feature here and there. Um, I am also um, on the sysadmin team for the project and the security team for the project and the team that recognizes contributors among other things. And I am, a, as I mentioned, I'm a manager at Amazon. I am, run the team that does the upstream Postgres contribution. So our team is all about contributing to the project. And this is where you can get a hold of me. I'll have that on the, the uh, last slide as well. And I'll make the slides available somewhere. I'm not sure how scale does it. I can't remember. Okay, so we're here to talk about the problem with glibc collations. How many people are aware of the fact that there's a problem? Wow, I expected like all of you since you're here, but <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some some examples about that that make it obvious that this is a problem. I think it's a bigger problem than most people recognize. Um, I'm gonna show you, you know, if you run into it what you would have to do to fix it. And then at the end of the talk, I'm gonna talk about an alternative approach that I developed. And it's been in use now for well over a year. I can't say exactly how many instances it's running on, but it's, it's on quite a few. Okay, so we'll start out if you're, you're on a RHEL 7 system, right? And I mean, is everyone here familiar with the basic you know, syntax of setting up a Postgres database, you know, init DB, and then PG control start, right? And then I'm, I'm into Postgres. So I, that's all I did was just build a new database on a RHEL 7 machine. And this query here is gonna just show us information about the encoding that the database is using. The, the encoding and the collation, I should say. And so you can see that the collation it's using on a RHEL 7 machine is 2.17, and that's because on a RHEL 7 machine, glibc is 2.17-326. At least the last time I checked, it was 326. Might be something newer now. And if you do the same thing, <coughs> excuse me, on a RHEL 9 machine, you'll see that you've got glibc 2.34. So you say, oh, no problem. That's just like a, a minor version change, right? Well, no, actually, the, the way that glibc does their versioning, each of 2.17, 2.18, 2.19, each one of those would be a major version change. And typically for a given distribution, they'll freeze that major version. So that's why rel 7.9 still has 2.17. But the dash 326 means like 326 versions of that package have been released. I'm gonna get into that later on, why that's important. But um, suffice it to say, as you change your OS version, you're gonna get a new glibc version, major version. All right, so this is, the, this is what I call the in your face slide. Um, for anyone who wasn't aware there wasn't a problem or anyone who thought, well, Maybe there's a problem, but I probably won't be affected because I don't use, I don't do anything fancy, right? Well, you can't get much simpler than this, right? We've got three values, one dash A, one A, and one dash AA. And on a RHEL 7 machine, if you sort those, you're gonna get this order. One A, one dash A, one dash AA. On a RHEL 9 machine, you're gonna get this order. 1 dash A, 1 A, 1 dash A, A. Okay, so if you thought this was like an esoteric problem that you probably won't run into because you just do simple stuff, you may not be simple enough. Maybe you are, but maybe not. You can be just using the ASCII characters and run into this problem. And 
remember, I just basically built the database with all the defaults, right, when I did init DB. So I got EN, US, UTF-8 because that's what, my, that's what my system is and that's what Postgres will pick up. All right, so we're gonna drill in a little bit deeper now. Is there any question about that before I go on? Okay. Hopefully I've got you beginning to get scared. All right, so we're gonna start out by creating a table on rel seven. And so I'm, it's you know one column table with a text column. I'm gonna make it a primary key that's important for the purposes of this demonstration. I'm gonna insert those three same values into that and then I just do a order by, a select order by from that table and I get that same order we just saw, right? No big surprise there. So now if I take that machine and upgrade it to RHEL 9 underneath my database, now this could happen in a number of ways, right? But you know, you may not, as the person responsible for the database, you may not even have a choice, right? Someone else may decide that for you. One of the things you should notice though is when I first start up the database, if I immediately do that same select order by, I get the same order. So you, you look at that and you say, well, what's wrong? This, this is working perfectly. There's nothing wrong with my database. And so now the next thing you do is you go insert another row. Except, remember I had a primary key on this column and I'm inserting another row with the same value that I already had, that should be an error. But guess what? It succeeds. So now, not only am I getting sorting in the wrong order, but I have a corrupted table. And if I try and re-index that table to fix this problem, that's going to fail now because I'm trying to re-index a unique index with my primary key. So that's not going to work. So this is just the, the very simplest scenario and already you can see how it, how it can bite you. So I'm gonna go back to this query that we used earlier and, I, and you can see this part here where it does PG database collation actual version. This function will actually look, basically it, it uses the libc call to say what version am I? Right, and it shows you that. And so you can see that you know we were built on 2.17. What's on the system now is 2.34. That kind of explains why we're in this hot water now. All right, so what if I gotta get out of this mess? Well, first thing I'm gonna do is actually drop my primary key and then I, how many people are familiar with the CTID column? Just a few. So the CTID is, is a system column. It's not normally shown if you do select star from some table, but it's basically a physical row identifier. And what I'm gonna do is use that to show me, to disambiguate these two rows so I can pick one to delete. Now, had this been a more complicated table, with more columns, and if one of the columns was different across those two row versions, you gotta figure out which one to keep. So you're still, you know, it's, it's not clean. You're gonna have a problem. So the lesson here is one of the things you gotta be careful about is not only these glibc versions, but if you're gonna rebuild all your indexes, which is what we're gonna do to get ourselves out of this, you really have to do that before you let anyone into your database after the OS upgrade. You cannot let anyone insert, update, or delete before you rebuild those indexes or you're gonna wind up with a problem. Or I shouldn't say you will, but I should say you very well might. So you can see here I deleted the second one just because CTID larger indicates it's probably the newer one that it was inserted um, in error. Although if you're familiar with the term wraparound in Postgres, 
if Postgres wraps around the transactions wrap around, if you've heard of that, it, it's possible that the the newer CTID could actually be the older row. So you can't necessarily count on that either. But in any case, you'll have to figure out one of them and get rid of it if you want to rebuild that. You want to rebuild that, add, re add the primary key, which will rebuild that unique index. And then if you do this alter database refresh collation version, what that will do is it'll go update the system catalog to say, all right, now we recognize that we're running with the newer version of glibc. It actually, that doesn't fix anything for you. It just like updates the catalog to say that's what I'm doing. So in fact, you could run this and still have corrupt indexes. And it would, it would look like, you know, you're using the newer version of glibc, but you wouldn't actually have fixed anything yet. So now once I've done all that, if I run my order by, select order by again, now I'm finally seeing the order that I would have expected on rel nine for those three values. And if I go back to my query to look at the system table, I can see that my dat call version matches whatever the actual on the system. Now that I've done the refresh. Okay, so now we're gonna take it up a notch. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is something I call the collation torture test. Jeremy Schneider, who's back here, um, created a, a, a GitHub repo um, which produces, so let's see, I've got this right here. Oops, sorry. Did it again. This repository that he created um, basically generates roughly 26 million strings that are in the like one to five or six character length, but they're all like these crazy Unicode characters. And he built that, as I understand it, he, Jeremy has, has got a lot of experience dealing with customers who have done strange things. So he's, he's seen a lot. And so he's got some good intuition as to what sorts of things might cause problems with these collations changing from version to version of glibc. And so we kind of built this test. It, you know, there's no way to exhaustively test every possibility, but this tests a lot of stuff, right? And this test is not a database test. It just produces basically a file of strings. And he did a bunch of things across different OSs. And you can look through his readme, and it's got some interesting data in and of itself. But what I did was I took that, um, the data from that, and I just used a little Python magic to, uh, to properly um, double up the double quotes that were in those strings and then, and then put double quotes around them so it was easy to suck it into a Postgres table. And so getting back to the slides, if I create this table, unsorted table, just one column again, and I'm gonna bulk copy that formatted Unicode text, which is his output with my quotes. And then I do a vacuum freeze whenever you bulk load. You really should vacuum freeze afterwards for a lot of good reasons, but that's like unrelated to this talk. And now this query here, which I'll use repeatedly, is basically doing an order by all of the strings in that table and then doing a string egg with no delimiter. So it basically just jams them all together into one long string and then calculates an MD5 over it. So you can consider that like a signature or a fingerprint for our sort, right? So if that value is the same, we know that the sorting is the same over these 26 million crazy strings. Now, Keep in mind, as we go through the talk, this 7130, that's the kind of the signature we're looking for. And I also want you to notice this timing here. This was about three minutes to do this sort. In a, in a few slides, you're gonna see why I want, wanted to point that out. And I'll, again, I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth later on. But th there's links in here for 
um, Jeremy's GitHub, as well as the formatted um, text that I pulled into my table is available online as well if you wanted to play with this. Okay, so now I'm gonna build an index, an indexed version of that table. So basically I'm just doing an insert into a new table from the unsorted table and I'm gonna create an index on it. And you can see when I do that same select, again, I get the 70, 130, so it's the same order. And you can see now it's like three seconds. So really fast, it used the index. And by now everything was cached. Okay, there's an extension that comes with Postgres called AmCheck. Um, one of the functions available in AmCheck will let you check the uh, validity of an index at a very low level. I think, I think that some of those functions were written by Peter Gagan, I think, for the index checking part of it. Most of them, yeah. So Peter Gagan is also on our team at Amazon. Um, spends a lot of time with his head like way down deep in the index code. So when you run those checks against the both the primary key on our little table and on, on the index table, it comes back with nothing, which basically means there was no error. So those indexes are currently good. So now I'm gonna upgrade this same machine again. So I'm kind of flipping back and forth between rel seven and rel nine. I've now taken that same table that was built on rel seven onto a rel, I've upgraded the OS to rel nine. And now when I do that select order by from the unsorted table, you notice my signature has changed because I'm getting a different order. You also notice it now takes almost an hour. Now, I, I, like I said, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, but the, the short thing to catch there is, this is a later version of glibc. And a, so like I said, there's, there's a, a performance regression that may or may not affect you, but if you've got a lot of multi-byte, you know, Unicode strings that are being sorted, it, it may matter a lot. Now, the other thing you can see here, and this shouldn't be a surprise at this point, but if I select from that index table, I'm still getting the same signature. But remember, we're on rel nine. This is actually a corrupt index. It's not producing the correct result. If it was the correct result, it should match that now. Right? And it still takes about three seconds. And now when I use my AmCheck on the RHEL 9 machine after the upgrade, you'll see I get errors. So I get this item order invariant violated. So this means basically you've got a corrupt index. So both the little table and the big table have corrupt indexes now. <coughs> So this time I was smart enough not to let anyone go in and do any updates or deletes to my, to my big table, fortunately, right? So at this point, all I really need to do is re-index. So when I re-index, you'll see now I get the, the expected order for a RHEL 9 machine, and I no longer get an error from AmCheck. Okay, so that's, kind of the end of that part of the, the scare tactics. <laughs> Any questions about all of that? Yeah, go ahead. This, this behavior is what you'll get if you started out on say a RHEL 7 machine with Postgres and then you upgraded the OS without rebuilding your indexes. If it's clean install, then right out of the gate, you're just gonna get the RHEL 9 sorting semantics, so there won't be a problem. But eventually, when you upgrade RHEL 9 to RHEL 10 or whatever, you're gonna have a problem. 
Well, yeah, I, and this is I'm gonna get I'm gonna get into this in a minute, but yeah. So Devram, Devram's point is actually covered on the next slide, which is anytime you have a distributed cluster, you have to worry about the OS is not matching. Right. Go ahead, Jonathan. Oh, I, I see. Jonathan is is uh, feeding me a uh, leading question. Yes, actually, um, it's that's a good point. There's um, there have been spotted in the wild cases where minor versions of glibc changing has caused changes, unintentional changes in collation. So indexes have been broken by what should have been a minor version change of glibc. And by the way, it's also been spotted in the wild where there was a, a, a minor version of ICU that broke collation. So I mean, it's not just glibc. ICU has had this problem. Um, one of the things, and, and again, I'll talk about this a little bit more, more with the alternate solution, but one of the things you find out when you really start digging into this is glibc uses some data files and it uses some shared object libraries that it pulls in in order to do all this locale magic. And so it's dependent on data and code. And you can break, you can change collation unintentionally with either. If the data changes, you could change collation, but if the code changes, you can definitely have changes in collation. Michael? So, so which, this was Suzy? So Suzy actually did an, a major version in a service pack. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that one. Okay, that's 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 good to know. Go ahead. Oh, so you you've basically facilitated database loading in the GitHub repo. Uh, so Jeremy has has made his uh, his stuff more convenient to use if you want to test a database. Awesome. All right. So this is a different example. This is the this is the distributed cluster example. So in this case, I'm already I'm on a rel nine machine, and I'm creating the Postgres foreign data wrapper, right? And then I create a foreign server that points back at a rel seven machine. And I'm still using that little three row table, right? And so I create a mapping for a user, and then I create a foreign table that points to that three column, that three row table on the rel seven machine from the rel nine machine. Is that all clear as mud? Now, you notice one of the things I did here with these options, I wanted to force a certain plan in order to facilitate what I'm trying to show here. But you know, suffice it to say that you could run into this in the wild in real, real life use cases. So once I've done that, now I'm going to do this join of a local table on the rel nine machine to my foreign table that's mapped to the rel seven machine. I'm just trying to join on that column, right? And those three rows should be the same in both tables, and it should just work, right? But instead, I get this. Error, merge join input data is out of order. And why is that? Because a merge join assumes that the data is sorted consistently on both sides of the join. And because one of them is sorted differently on rel seven than rel nine, it detects that, that it, it doesn't know what to do. Postgres doesn't know how to handle that, right? So it throws an error. And you can see here in the explain plan, you can see this is one of the things Postgres will do 
is try and push down the order by if it can, right? And so by forcing this plan where it pushed down the order by, I got on the RHEL 7 machine, I got its order, and I tried to join on the RHEL 9 machine with its order, and that's why this didn't work. Okay, so here's a third type of problem. And, and I, I'm not going to say by any means these are the only three types of problems you might run into. I just, you know, really couldn't get any more slides into this talk and thought this was enough to convince people they needed to be worried about it. But <clears throat> this is another kind of legitimate thing that you might run into. If you've got partition tables and you partition on a range, so you can see here I've created a partition by range. And then part one is from min to 1-a, and part two is from 1-a to max, right? And so when you do this, it's basically inclusive on this side and exclusive on that side, right? So this takes everything up to but not including 1-a, and this takes 1-a and everything greater, right? And so on the RHEL 7 machine, when I do an insert of 1-a, that value ends up in the first partition. But now on a RHEL 9 machine, if I insert that same value, it's going to go to the second partition. So if you were depending on, you know, with partition tables, you really can't have a primary key that spans the partitions, right? So if you're depending on the partitioning scheme to maintain uniqueness, you, you just failed. And if you're looking for your 1A value, on your RHEL 9 machine, it may not be in the place, the partition where you expect it. So again, this is just a third type of problem. All right, so I'm just going to summarize everything I just talked about. Your, your collation was almost certainly provided by glibc if you're on Postgres 15 or earlier. On 16, there were some changes made that made it more, more reasonable to have ICU sort of database-wide. Um, I don't think many people use ICU database-wide, however. So probably all of you are using glibc for all of your collations. So it, it most likely affects you. Sort order relies on collation. Indexes persist sort order. Um, constraints may depend on order. I mean, that's another thing I didn't really show, but you could have like a check constraint that depends on ordering. Partitioning depends on ordering. Merge, join, and other operations may depend on ordering. Distributed clusters might depend on ordering being the same. And he, by the way, this is not necessarily just Postgres, right? There are lots of distributed systems out there that today, and to the extent that they depend on glibc or even ICU for their ordering, you could be getting incorrect results as things get merged together. Things I, I don't know how Hadoop works, but that type of use case comes to mind. So here's the other half of why it's important. Actually, in my, my slide until this morning, I, I thought RHEL 7 was end of life in 2026. And I think maybe a year ago when I first built these slides, it was. And they, I think they may have pulled the date in. But it now very clearly says that the end of June in 2024 is end of life for RHEL 7. And I'm willing to bet a lot of RHEL 7 machines are still out there. And Debian also, end of June, and Ubuntu 14.04, which is one of their long-term support versions, is end of life in April. Uh-oh, is that not working? Maybe my battery finally died. Wasn't doing that before. Okay, so all right. So the problems we need to tackle are broken indexes. You know, again, don't don't rebuild your index. Don't allow any DML to occur in your database before you rebuild the indexes. If you've done an OS upgrade, otherwise you'll have a bigger mess to solve. 
Um, distributed systems, you have to pay attention. Replicas can have problems. Foreign servers can have problems. All right, so now I'm going to get into the third part of the talk, which is the solution that I worked on for this problem. Does anyone have questions about any of the preceding stuff before I move on? How am I doing time-wise, Deborah? How much? 25 minutes? Oh, I got plenty of time. Okay, good. All right, go ahead. Twenty-eight was the was the huge change. Well, I, I think Jer Jeremy's conclusion, I think, has been that every major version of glibc has some changes. Two dot twenty-eight was like a huge change, so that one was like the the obvious one, but. Every major version has potentially some changes somewhere. No? There have been some where nothing changed? Right. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't mean that just, past, just because you're past 2.28 doesn't mean like you'll never have a problem. And, and you know, to some extent, some of this depends on what Unicode does too, right? But I, I mean, I think some of the problems that people run into are when they have data in the database that's at an unassigned code point. So it's an unassigned Unicode code point, right? So some data gets in there through some user form or whatever, right? It's 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 really not an assigned character. And then some later version of Unicode comes out and it like assigns it. And then it needs to put it in proper sort order. And so that character is suddenly gonna start sorting differently. Right, I, I think I got that right. So you didn't see any changes between eight and nine, or? Okay, so the solution I worked on, I, we called it lib compact collation. After lots of discussion, you know, one of the hardest problems in computer science is naming things, right? Um, what it is is a method to build an extracted, the locale functionality extracted out of glibc by itself standalone, kind of in a nutshell. And that is done in a way that makes it portable, at least in theory. Um, I mean, it, and in practice, I mean, we've, I've tested that across several major versions and it does work. Can't promise it'll work everywhere for everything but for the things that we've needed it for, it's worked great. Um, it allows you to basically pin to a specific collation semantic based on a very specific glibc. And, you know, we've tested this both for x86, 64, as well as ARCH64, so it works with ARM. And you can either link Postgres to this library and use those versions of the locale functions, or you can use LD preload, either one that you prefer. Now this is available in um, on GitHub. Oh, I was gonna talk about this. I, I think actually I talk about this later. Um, So this is, this is the location on GitHub, and one of the things to note here, because I've gotten this question a few times, if you come into this repository and you just look at the, like the main, there's like nothing there. It looks like there's nothing there. And this, this is, it's an odd way to handle the repository, but after a lot of discussion about the details of how this stuff works, we decided it made sense. So 
I'm sorry if you don't like it, but this is the way it is. So you'll see there are two branches here, 217-326-EL7 and 226-59 Amazon 2. So basically what we've done is we've created this based on very specific RPM package versions, one of which was from RHEL 7 and one of which was from AL2. And the reason that these are so specific is because, as we talked about, even on a minor version change, you can get subtle changes in behavior. So how you would you, if you wanted to use this, you would clone the GitHub repository. You check out one of those two branches, right? And then you just basically run glibc compact collation build and then install the RPM. And that RPM has no dependencies. You build it on a RHEL 7 machine, you should be able to install it on your RHEL 9 machine. And I've taken the binaries out of that RPM and installed them on my Linux Mint desktop, and they work just fine. Okay, so, uh, you know, again, the way this is built is, if you go back and look at this repository, you'll see that it's built on top of specific glibc sources, including, basically it, what, it, what happens is if you did an RPM source install, let's say for glibc 2.17, you would get a sources directory and a spec directory, right? And in the sources directory, you see this? I'm just gonna scroll this really quick. See all these? Those are all patches that get applied by the RPM maintainer. So whenever you install RPMs on a Linux system, the maintainer of those RPMs are applying patches to the upstream tarball, which may or may not change the behavior of collation, right? So in the spirit of like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Intel copy exact, but the idea here is we want copy exact. We want exactly the same, you could call it bug compatible, whatever you want to call it. We want exactly the same behavior of, as we get from one very specific RPM version of glibc. And so that's what this is built on top of, is it basically we do a, a, an RPM source install and apply our patches on top of it, and that's what's in this repository. There are two distinct types of changes. There's a few small changes to the glibc source code itself, and then there's some somewhat larger changes that are required to actually get it to build. The goal was to minimize the changes, because again, we wanna make sure that it was easy to reason about the changes, especially the ones to glibc itself, to make sure that we weren't gonna inadvertently change collation. And they kind of fit into four categories. There's, there, glibc had a, has a lot of kind of hard-coded assumptions about file paths. So like I said earlier, glibc locale functionality depends on libraries that it loads as well as data files that it loads. And those are in a very specific path on your system, typically something like user lib locale or something like that, right? Well, those are hard-coded at build time for glibc and we wanna have our own set in parallel with the system glibc. So we had to modify those paths so we could have a path that we could control what's in it. We also wanted to have, glibc is, a, is kind of um, very cross-linked in that, you know, since virtually everything that you build on a Linux system is coming from libc, right? The, all the basic functionality, right? If you want to allocate memory, that's going to come from, from libc, right? So these things are all tightly cross-linked. And what we wanted to do is just extract just the stuff that was needed for locale. But in order to make this portable, we wanted to be able to run on a system with a different version of libc. So we didn't want to pull out the, um, the functionality that wasn't specifically related to the locale. And then kind of related to that, glibc 
exhaustively kind of versions of symbols. And I, I'm not sure, how many people here are familiar with symbol versioning in libraries, kind of sort of? So like if I, I've got a function call, string call in glibc, under the covers it's really string call glibc dash two dot whatever, right? And that will indicate which version of glibc that particular version of that function comes from. And when you link that into your program, that's what your program is gonna look for. So we wanted to replace those with the versions from this compatibility library so that when you inspect the binary, it was really clear which of the function calls were actually coming from libc versus which were coming from the compatibility library. As I alluded to, you can preload. In that case, you have to build slightly differently, which I'll show in a couple of slides. And when you do that, it will actually preserve the original glibc symbols. And then some really minor changes to the functionality. Really, I think mostly just that, that one function that rep reports the version of glibc. Instead of reporting 2.17, it's now going to report 2.17-326.2. EL7, so that it very specifically tells us what this came from. So for the package building code, we had to touch the spec file, basically get it to build what we wanted and not build all the stuff, all the other glibc stuff that we didn't care about. The uh, custom build support, there's three main files. This um, buildfiles.txt, basically in glibc, every Every function that you would call from libc, like, again, memcopy or something, has its own C file in glibc tree. And so this build files text basically shows you all of the functions that were extracted out of libc in order to build this collation library. The libcompat collation map is the symbol map. So for the, all of the symbols that we wanted to remap to our own symbol names, that control is controlled by that, and then there's the build scripts themselves. And then as I talked about, if you did want to use this and you wanted to preload and not, com not specifically build Postgres against the compatibility library, you would just have to tweak this one setting in the build file. Okay, so I, I just want to go through some lessons learned uh, that that I, I had as I was developing this thing. As I talked about, when you build glibc, there's all this functionality that we didn't want, and much of that functionality actually is, is intimately tied to another library in your system, which is called ld.so. ld is the dynamic loader, so when you load a shared object library, when, you're, when Postgres starts and it loads all these shared objects for extensions and whatnot, LD is what loads them. LD has some data structures, specifically this 10 minutes, okay, RT LD.global and the art read only version of that that keep track of things like about your CPU and other locks and stuff that it's holding. And those structs, as you can imagine, change from one version of glibc to another. And so you didn't want anything left in the compatibility library that referenced one of these structs. And at first, it took a while to figure out where all those were and get them out of there. But that was fixed pretty early on. Again, that, that rel9 timing that I talked about, there's actually a commit. This is the commit in 2014. I don't know if you can read that. It says, improve performance by removing a cache. Now, to, to the author's credit, he goes through a lot of, he has some data here that he apparently tested something and proved to himself that this was faster in most cases, the way people use glibc. I, I, have to, I haven't really looked at it that closely, but I have to assume he just, he didn't use, certainly didn't use Jeremy's 26 million string torture test um, because this, this commit is what took us from three minutes to 60 minutes for that sort. So one of the benefits that you get out of this, if you were to stick with the, the this library from 2.17, is you get the old faster version on the newer system. 
But by the way, if you I ran the same test with ICU and they were about the same speed as the faster earlier version of glibc. Yeah. It it changed it changed sort order, yes. That's an example of C code only changes that affected sort order. Okay, so next thing, I, I ran into an issue with um, C type init. I, this was a threads thing. Didn't get picked up initially because Postgres is not multi threaded. So didn't run into the problem. But it turns out things like PG Bench, PG Dump can run multi threaded. And what happens is the C type init is needed to initiate some structures that are used for the C type calls, which are things like upper and lower and what type, you know, what type of character is this? And those happen to be thread local variables. And so when libc does this, it's, it runs this at startup. So when libc loads, it runs this. But then it reruns it every time it starts a thread. Well, the problem was is since that's running in libc, not in the compatibility library, it wasn't reinitializing these variables in the threads. And so that was causing problems, but that's been fixed as well. And then there, there were some cases. Um, PSQL was uh, was the, probably the best case. It was linked both to the compatibility library, but also to libpq. Libpq, the client side libpq, was not getting the compatibility library linked because of a filter in the make file. So actually, if you want to fix that, I have a patch which is linked somewhere on one of my slides. Um, that will just, it's like a really simple patch to some make files in the Postgres tree, which get them to actually use libcompact call for some of the tools. But because of that, set locale was actually getting called in one place in the compatibility library, and in another place it was getting called in libc, and of, of course that didn't work very well. And then the final problem I ran into is that the difference when you build with optimization or not, if you build, when you build a binary in, in a, on, a, on a Linux system with GCC, you typically say dash O2 mean, means optimization level two. So that kicks in certain things like inline functions. But if you build with dash O0, which is as a dev developer you often will do because you don't want the optimizations because it makes it harder to debug. So I was building with O0. I wasn't seeing this problem. We had the real builds with O2, and suddenly it was like, well, why is this breaking? And that's because there were some things missing from the exported symbol map. All right, so real quick, I, I think I'm, I have five minutes. Is that allowing for questions? I get until 3.30. All right, I got 10 minutes. All right, thank you. It's like daylight savings time. I just got more time. All right, so I'm on um, on a RHEL 9 system. I install the RPM for my 2.17 RPM for the compact call. And then in when I configure, this, now this is a source build of Postgres. I assume if you're going to get into this, you, you're at least comfortable with this sort of thing. When you run configure, you have to have libs and then include that on there. And the way GCC will build, if you build with a library specifically on the um, link line, it's linked before libc. And therefore, if the symbol names are the same, your version will get used instead of the libc version. Oh, and this is, the, I referenced that patch earlier. So if you really want to capture all of the tools, you have to fix those make files. That's what this patch does. It's maybe something I should get upstreamed. I haven't really tried too hard, though. All right, so you test it out. So you remember, we're on a RHEL 9 system, but now we're seeing the same sorting that we would 
see if we are on a RHEL 7 system. And if we try and insert a duplicate value into that table, we're going to get an error, which we'd expect. It doesn't go in there and corrupt the index. And now if we run that same query again, the actual collation is showing up. This is that change I was talking about in the glibc version function. It now shows the specific version that we're running at. And so when we use, when we do our string test again, now you're getting back to that signature that we expect from a RHEL 7 machine, but it's on the RHEL 9 machine, and the timing is back to our three minutes. And of course, our indexed version is also getting the right answer. And AmCheck shows no problems with our indexes. OK, so just a couple more slides. This is really just if you're interested in all that, all of this topic, if you wanted to play with this, this is one way that you can examine your Postgres binary and see which symbols have been linked to the compatibility library versus which symbols were linked to glibc itself. And so if you see something like set locale is, lim is link linked to libc, then something went wrong. And then this is sort of the same kind of thing. This script will go through your entire build tree and make sure all the binaries, all the binary objects in the build tree have been built. All the symbols that are in the map file are actually linked against the compatibility library, not libc. So these are just some helper things that I developed along the way to, to kind of validate that everything was working. So in summary, glibc collations can be hazardous. I kind of covered it in some ways that you could fix that or at least deal with it. And I showed a, an alternative approach. So I think I've got a few minutes left for any additional questions. Five minutes. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so the question was, is Devrim going to include that in the RPMs? And Devrim gave an emphatic no. Jonathan? Right, so Jonathan's question is, what do we need to do upstream to make this better? Part of that answer, I actually meant to talk about this. Yesterday, Jeff Davis, who's also on our team at Amazon, while I was working on this kind of how do we deal with the legacy stuff, I asked Jeff, why don't you please look at fixing this going forward? And so Jeff has actually gotten the very first commit that provides a built-in collation provider. I think it's not complete yet. I, I understand from him, he. He's hoping to get everything in there. So it's 17 at least has an option for a built-in collation, which then means this stuff is all in the hands of the Postgres developers and we're not dependent, <coughs> excuse me, dependent on what's going on in the system. So that's part of what needs to happen, I think. It doesn't solve all problems, but it, for a lot of use cases, this is just perfect because you're, you're really depending on your indexes to do lookups fast and joins fast and there's only some cases where you care about you know does 1a sort before 1-a or not right and in those cases you can actually put a collate clause on your sql and get it to use a different collation so and 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 this will be a lot faster even than the 217 glibc to boot and it'll be faster in icu cuz it's just basically doing binary compares so that's part of it. The other part of it, I think, is it's something that's come up. Um, Thomas Monroe posted like a proof of concept. Of, it's been, I guess, a year or two ago now. But um, he, he posted a proof of concept for a way to load multiple collation libraries simultaneously into Postgres. And really, ultimately, we need that so that when you go to the new OS, we still need Devrim to like support old versions of ICU, right? 
So when you go to the new, new OS, you have to have the old ICU and the new ICU, and then your indexes will still work off the old ICU, but then you have a migration path online to start building indexes concurrently that use the new ICU, and so that you can kind of in a controlled way cut yourself over from the older to the newer. So that's ultimately, I think, what we're gonna need to, to get to. I, that's not gonna happen in 17. Maybe that'll happen in Postgres 18. You know, we can cross our fingers. Well, it, it, unless you build it with the uh, the preload preload option, so that it can only be used preloaded. So, if you do that, then basically they just have to install the RPM and set up LD preload. <laughs> I mean, the re the reason we didn't default to using preload is because it's a little bit it's a little bit harder to verify that you're actually getting the symbols pulled out of the right library when you're preloading. And if someone like messes with your preloading settings and all of a sudden you go from being using the compatibility library to using libc, that would be that would basically break your indexes. So I think preloading is a little bit more fragile, um, but it would be easier because then you don't have to rebuild all the Postgres binaries. You could just it would just work. Michael, did you have another? I think we got like one. Yeah. Absolutely, it's an open source project. So if you wanted to, you know, I we needed the AL2 version. Uh, I did the. The, the Red Hat 7 version, because I figured that covers a lot of people, right? But if you had another version, and you and I'll, I'll be happy to, you know, I, I'll be happy to help you get through doing that. It's not, when I, I originally developed this for AL2, and when I did the RHEL 7 version, I think it took me like a day and a half of hacking to get it to work. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like a moon launch, but it wasn't like trivial. Well, yeah, if it, that's true. If it's if it's Debian, I, I'm I'm happy to work with you to try and make it work even on Debian. It's just that would be a heavier lift. All right, I think that's all the time we've got. So, thank you very much. If you've got any other questions, I'll be around in the booth on the weekend. Come visit us.